Good morning, church. I want to welcome everybody here this morning and welcome everybody, every one of those that are watching on Facebook Live today. Um, just a couple quick announcements. Just a reminder that Pastor Scott is on vacation uh, for this week and next week as well. Um, so we just appreciate your prayers for him that he would have a, a good and restful vacation, a good time away. Um, so if there, are, if there are any emergencies that should arise, um, the deacons will be available to, to respond to that. Uh, we just ask you try contacting the church office first, and if you can't get a hold of anybody there, then contact one of the deacons. Um, so myself, Mark Conniff, um, Gil Viedler, and my mind's going blank, um, Ron Sagner, <laughs> and, you know, Terry Henry as well. So, so yeah. I knew I'd forget because I didn't have them written down. One of my, it's my fault. Um, so anyway, I just want to uh, thank everybody for coming here today. Just remind everybody of you know to maintain the social distancing when we can. And um, so without anything else, we're going to introduce Travis Pelletier. Travis had uh, contacted Scott a, f a few weeks back, told him that he was willing to to come in and fill in so Scott could get a vacation. So Scott is going to, um, Travis is going to give us a message this morning and. Tell us a little about himself, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, my mic's not on. Is that bad? Oh, that is a lot better. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so today we are going to be talking about a topic that's actually very rarely preached on. Um, and this thing oh sweet it's ready to go all right go ahead and turn your bibles to john chapter 16 john chapter 16 verses 12 through 15 is what we're going to read on just to start the conversation today john chapter 16 verses 12 through 15 this is one of the passages in scripture where you can see all three of the members of the godhead three members of the trinity discussed in one passage. John 16, starting in verse 12. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will receive of me and shall show it to you. All things that the Father have, have are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of me and show it to you. So, like I said, the uh, topic of the Trinity is very rarely preached on uh, directly, uh, as far as like a whole uh, structured message on it. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one reason is that there's actually no place in Scripture where it's clearly taught in one passage. So, if you're just preaching expositionally through the passages, it's not going to come up in that way. Um, and another reason is that. Um, it's actually a kind of difficult topic, and it can seem really abstract and theological and not very applicable to our daily lives, and so it, uh, it's, it can, it's avoided a lot of times for those reasons. However, it's worth saying that the Trinity, the doctrine of who God is, what his nature is like, um, is one of the most central doctrines of the Christian faith. It's so important that the early church actually established it as necessary for salvation. You had to understand who God was, his nature, as three persons in order to be a believer. And I think this actually kind of makes sense, um, because the Trinity is, is such an essential description of who God is that if you deny it, you're no longer even really talking about the same God. Um, oh, am I walking off camera when I do this? No? Okay. Great. Sorry for Facebook Live. Okay. Um, and let me, let me illustrate this for you all. Let's say that you uh, have a friend. You and I have a friend named Bob. And we, uh, I start talking about Bob, and we agree that he's about six feet tall. He's the son of Patricia and Bill. You know, we agree on all these big details, but we can't agree on the color of his, of his eyes. Well, we're still talking about the same person, right, even if we can't agree on a minor detail. But let's say you and I start talking about Bob, and I say he's six foot four, and he's the son of Patricia and Bill, and you say, no, no, he's five eight, and he's the son of Ted. What are you talking about? At some point, we're going to realize we're not talking about the same person, right? 
This is why the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of God's nature as being three persons, um, is so important because if you deny it, you're suddenly not really talking about the same God anymore. The early church actually said that anyone who denies this is accursed, is the word they use. That's really strong language. And it makes us a little uncomfortable. Um, But honestly, the Trinity is one of the clearest cases of there actually being a standard that Christians really need to hold to. If you take any of the Christian cults out there, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, things like that, what identifies them as a cult is primarily, not only, but primarily that they deny the nature of God. They deny the Trinity. And that's why they're not considered part of the Christian church at large. Um, Now, unfortunately, the Trinity is also very misunderstood by Christians themselves. I've, uh, for those of you that know who I am, I'm a a full-time missionary. I do Uh, I teach Christian youth how to know what Christianity is and how to defend it. Um, So this is what I... I'm a teacher. You'll get that from this this message. It's more of a a, a lesson than a sermon, but I will have some good application, I promise, towards the end. Um, But uh, when I ask Christian youth to explain to me, so what is God like? What is the Trinity? Very often, what they'll explain to me is heresy, unfortunately. Um, So it's worth taking some time to really dig into this and understand what it is. What is the Trinity? And like I said, this is going to start out kind of dry, just what, what is the doctrine, but I am going to get to why this matters, and it does matter a lot as far as to our relationship with God and with each other. So the Trinity is not the idea that there is one God and three gods, okay? It's not it. The Trinity is the teaching that there is one God who exists eternally in three distinct persons. That is the idea of the Trinity. We have one God, but he exists as three persons. Why not one God and three gods? Well, first off, that's a contradiction, and God does not contradict himself. Secondly, that would be polytheism, the idea that there are many gods, three gods, and we're, Christians are monotheists. So no, it's not that there's one God and three gods, it's that there's one God and three persons. Okay? This is an illustration of it um, that has been used since the times of the early church. That is is thousands of years old, this, this illustration here. So you can notice there's three corners, and I'm sorry for those on Facebook Live that can't, uh, can't see this, um, but if you look up uh, just an illustration of the Trinity on Google Images, it'll, it'll come up. It'll be one of them. You have three corners of the triangle. Each one has one of the members of the Trinity. You have the Father, you have the Son, the Holy Spirit, and it says that all three of those are God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But they're three distinct persons. They're not the same person, right? So the Father is not the same person as the Son. The Son is not the same person as the Holy Spirit. They're distinct. And this means that um, there's an analogy that I've often heard, right? The Trinity is like water. Sometimes it's liquid, sometimes it's gas, sometimes it's ice, but it's the same substance. That's actually not a correct illustration of the Trinity because water is the same substance that just takes three forms. The Trinity isn't one person in three forms or one God in three forms. It's one God in three distinct persons. Hard to wrap your mind around, but it is important to understand that uh, correctly. All right, so at some point, since we are a bunch of Baptists here, someone's going to start and get worried. Well, hang on, Travis, you're not using any scripture yet. I've been, give, I've been giving you all these discussions of what Christians believe about the Trinity, and I haven't quoted a single verse. And if, some, if any of you have ever had discussions with Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, They will be very quick to tell you the word Trinity isn't even in the Bible, and they are right. But hang on, how in the world can I say this doctrine matters so much, it's so important, when it's not even in Scripture? Well, it's actually a very simple answer to that. The answer is that the definition that I gave you of the Trinity is very thoroughly attested to throughout the New Testament. Very clear scriptural principles that are taught throughout the New Testament even though the word isn't there. So, for example, these are, the, these are the seven statements that are all very clearly taught in the New Testament and throughout Scripture, and once you um, establish these seven points, the Trinity is undeniable in the New Testament. And by the way, um, I have handouts that I had on the table in the back, so you don't have to try and memorize this right now. And so uh, just work on understanding the concepts, and if you want to review it, you can just grab a handout on the way out. Um, For those of you on Facebook Live, you have the option to pause if you need to write things down. So, (laughs) Um, 
So the seven principles that establish the Trinity, are, are they go like this. First, God is one. There is only one God. Very well attested in Scripture. Second, the Father is God. Very well attested. Third, the Son is God. Same thing. The Holy Spirit is God. Okay, so you have one God and three persons that are all God. Very pretty, pretty simple there. But they're also distinct persons. They're not three forms of the same thing. They're three distinct persons. So it's also very clear in Scripture that the Father is not the Son. They're two different persons. That the Son is not the Spirit. They're two different persons. And that the Spirit is not the Father. So I'm going to go very quickly on a short whirlwind tour of Scripture. Let's give you a few examples of each of these points in Scripture and move on. Um, I'm not going to take too long because I do want to get to the application. I'm a theology nerd, so I love this stuff, but uh, I know it can get old. It can get kind of long and monotonous after a, after a while. So, first one, God is one. There's only one God. Let's give you a few examples. So, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A couple of things to notice there. First off, one God. Very clear. Second off, notice the word that is used to describe God. It's Lord, right? The word he's described as the Lord. Another example. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. Um, very clear. Also, by the way, that completely uh, is a great verse to use when you're talking to Mormons. Because Mormons believe that there's an infinite chain of gods that have existed going back into the past. And this verse very clearly falsifies that. And they do respect Scripture, so they'll, they'll listen to you if, you if you show them this. Um, and uh, the third, a third example is, Jesus answered and said to him, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's in Mark 12. And there are many, many, many other passages that I could use to, to, to show this. It is, once again, throughout Scripture. So, let's see here. Second principle, the Father is God. I'm just going to do this very briefly. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and... Oh, that's interesting. Notice the word Lord is now used to describe Jesus. Lord in the Old Testament is exclusively used of Yahweh. When you have the Lord, all capital letters, is used of Yahweh. In the New Testament, the authors of the New Testament were very careful to apply that to Jesus. That's important. Um, another example, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things. So the Father is God. And I'm going to skip through the next of these for time's sake. This sermon is meant to be about 35 to 40 minutes, and I'm going to shorten it a bit because I know here we normally go for about 25 minutes, I believe, is 25 to 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So the Father is God, and there are many other passages. Three, the Son is God. This is the most controversial one. This is, this is the point where Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, even uh, Islam, Muslims, really have a huge problem with this point. So I'll spend a little longer here. Um, Jesus Christ is God. I'm going to show you a few proof texts first off. So Hebrews 1.6. But about the Son, he says, your throne. So about the Son, Jesus. He says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Excuse me. And then we have... Um, John 1, 1 through 5, in verse 14, the famous passage, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, very clearly talking about Jesus saying He was God, He was with God in the beginning, and He made all things. Um, but, if you've ever talked with a cultist or uh, someone who's a Muslim, they know these passages, and they have ways they try and get around them. I don't think those ways work, but I've realized that in my study of this, that Christians don't realize how thorough the testification of Christ's deity is in the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't just give us one or two verses about Christ being God. It testifies to his deity all the way through. I'll give you some examples here, and then I'll give you a little acrostic to help you remember how, you, how to know Jesus as God. Um, first off, one example, you can look at Isaiah 45, 22 through 23, and I'll just, don't, go, don't bother turning to it, I'll read it to you. Um, there's this passage that is clearly talking about Yahweh, about God. Isaiah 45, 22 through 23. It says, God is speaking, and he says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else that unto me 
every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear or confess, is, uh, depending on the translation. If you turn to Philippians 2, 9 through 11, St. Paul takes this passage and he applies it directly to Jesus. He says, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I, oh wait, I'm sorry. Skip to the next one here. Um, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. He says, therefore God has highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul is quoting that Old Testament passage and saying this is actually about Jesus right here. But just to clarify that this, is a, this deity of Christ is taught throughout the New Testament, there's a little acrostic that I learned that helps a lot, and I call it HANDS, H-A-N-D-S. It stands for honors, attributes, names, deeds, and seat. Okay? HANDS. H, Jesus receives honors that are only due to God. Um, he is sung in songs of religious worship. He, he receives prayers. He receives songs of praise. He is glorified in doxologies. We're commanded to fear him, to serve him, and to love him in the same way as God. And those passages are very explicit. It says, as you love God and honor God, you honor Christ. Um, but not just honors, also attributes. The, the, the properties of God are actually described to Jesus. Christ is described in the New, in the New Testament as eternal, as uncreated, as unchanging, as all-powerful, and all-knowing, omnipresent, and morally perfect. Uh, in Colossians, Paul actually says that in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Um, so attributes, N is names. Uh, Jesus is called God directly. He's also called the Lord. He's also called the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Divine Savior, the Alpha and the Omega, and the Great I Am. Finally, deeds. Uh, Jesus is described as the creator and sustainer of all things. God is obviously the creator and sustainer of all things. Um, the sovereign ruler over all creation, the source of all spiritual blessings, and the judge of all people. And finally, S, seat. In Revelation, Christ sits on the highest throne of heaven, claiming equal authority with God. And from that throne, it's said that he will rule forever over all things. So, Jesus Christ is God. And I know I'm doing a real whirlwind tour of all these uh, principles. We're going to um, get to the application here in a minute. Finally, the Holy Spirit is God. This one's not very controversial, so let's give you a couple of passages to talk about this. Um, Acts chapter... Acts... There we go. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. This is a story of Ananias and Sapphira, where they lie to Peter. And Peter says, Ananias... How is it that Satan has filled your heart so that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. The Holy Spirit clearly being identified as God there. And there are other passages that I'll, I'll skip through for time's sake, but there, there's a lot of passages that talk about that. So, clearly, the first four principles are true. There is one God, and there are three persons that are identified as God in the New Testament, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But how do we know there are three different distinct persons rather than just God appearing in three forms? Well, it's because the Scripture also clearly teaches that the Father is not the Son. Because the Father sends the Son, because the Son speaks on his, not on his own behalf, but on behalf of the Father in John 14, 26, in Galatians 4, 26, in Galatians 4, 6. Um, the Father sends, loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. The Father and the Son count as two witnesses, not as one in John 5 and in John 8, 16. The Father and the Son glorify one another. The, Father and the Son is an advocate for us to the Father. Jesus Christ is also described as directly not the Father, but the Son of the Father. So, you know, all these, these certain descriptions make it clear that these are two different people. It's not the same person. The same thing is actually true of the, fa the idea that the Son is not the Spirit, because the Spirit speaks not on his own behalf, but on behalf of Jesus. Um, the Father loves... Sorry, let me skip down here in my notes. The Spirit glorifies Jesus, the Son. The Son sends the Spirit, who's another advocate. All these principles clearly teach that the Son and the Spirit are two distinct persons. They're not the same person. Um, and finally, the Spirit is not the Father, because the Father is the one who sends the Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit intercedes for us to the Father, which means they're clearly two different people. Okay, all right, so that was a whirlwind tour of why Christians believe in the Trinity. I know, that was a lot. 
Um, but when you, this is something that the early church really struggled with because they had all this biblical data that there was clearly three persons that were described as God, and they're distinct. But all throughout the New Testament, the authors say over and over again, there's only one God. And that's why the Trinity, the word Trinity became, came into use, because God is clearly one God in three distinct persons. Why does this matter? Why am I standing up here just theologizing to you all and putting you all to sleep about what the Trinity is? It's because the Trinity actually tells us some very important things about who God is, and not just that, but about our relationship to God and to each other. The Trinity tells us that God himself is relational. He's essentially relational. It's not just something where he created mankind for a relationship. Uh, God had a relationship already. He has never been a single person alone. There was never a time when God was lonely because he existed eternally in a loving relationship with the Trinity. Now, as humans, we are created in God's image. We are not intended to be solitary creatures. So remember, remember back in Genesis chapter 2, God creates mankind, and he says, what's the first thing he says? It is not good for man to be alone, right? We are communal creatures. We're intended to exist in a community. And that's what church is, part of what church is for, is for us to get together and grow together. Um, church isn't the sort of thing that, uh, I can be a Christian, but uh, church doesn't matter that much. There's no space for that in Scripture, because as humans, we're created to live as part of a community, and in Christ, we're created to be part of a community as well. But the Trinity also tells us that God's love is eternal. God, you know, the Scripture says, God is love, right? We use that phrase all the time, God is love. Why don't we just say that God is loving, right? Why not just say God loves, God is, is a loving, loving person? No, we say God is love. We identify him with love. Um, this actually makes sense when you understand the biblical concept of what love is. Biblically, and according to the early church as well, love was always defined as willing the good of the other person. So whatever holistically is good, not just one good thing, but what is the good for somebody? It's like the ultimate purpose for which they were created and which will give them the most joy and peace and happiness, the good. Willing that for the other person is described as love. So love is not, I'm going to make you happy today and cause suffering for you 10 years down the road, because that's not the good. It's not willing the good of the other. So love is others-oriented, and this means that if God was not three persons, then God could not have been love before he created mankind because there is no one else to love. If you're going to say that God is love in his very essence, then there has to be three persons there. Um, and the scripture actually gives us several passages so we can see how this love is expressed. How does God express this love to us? The most famous passage is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He gave. God's love is expressed in giving of himself. Um, not just that, but Romans 5, 8. It was read this morning and, and uh, very, very well discussed this morning. But God commended it. He showed his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. So God clearly isn't trying to get something from us, right? We're his enemies. We're not giving him anything. He's not gaining anything from us. But he loves us anyway. It's unconditional love. And this, there's, there's a passage that talks about this as well. Um, I think it's worth all reading together. If you, if you could turn to 1 John 4, verses 7 through 11. 1 John 4, 7 through 11, and one of the best passages, I think, on God's love um, in the New Testament. On God's love and its relationship to us. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Starting in verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not does not know God. Excuse me, for God is love. In this was made, was made known the love of God to us, in that 
God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So we need to be really clear here. God didn't create man because he needed somebody to love. He already existed in a love relationship. God doesn't need our love. He doesn't need our praise. God creates us because he is love in his very essence, and that love expresses itself in giving of himself to others. Um, But that last verse in that passage, um, where it says, Beloved, If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. I really want to challenge people here. Are we striving to mirror God's selfless love in our relationships? So pause for a moment and think. When you show love to someone, when you're kind to someone, are you doing that in order to be accepted? Do you want that person to show you affection, to show you kindness back? Is that why you're doing these things? And it's a very easy way to tell if that's why you're doing these things. Do you get angry when it's not reciprocated? Do you feel like that person didn't do what they were supposed to do? At that point, you should stop and question yourself, why were you doing that in the first place? Was it in order to love that person or was it to get something in return? Do we show love because we want to get affection or affirmation or any other response? Or is our love like God's love? It is a giving love that desires the good for the other person. And, and apply that to church. Why do you come to church? Do you come to church to get your needs met? I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, it, heard people say that I left this church because they just, my needs weren't being met there. Now, I want to be clear. I do think that church should provide for the needs of the people that come there. But that's, that's, not a, that's, that's not the question. The question is, why do you specifically, what is your purpose, your goal in coming to church? Is it to get something, or is it to give? Every time you come here, there are people here that you can encourage, that you can bless, that you can give, that you can give of yourself to. And if you leave church with the attitude every time that, oh, they just, I just didn't get anything, that really shows that you're not coming to church for the right reasons, is what it shows. Um, This is something to take very, very seriously. So, the Trinity tells us that God is relational, and so are we. It tells us that God's love is eternal, and that's the basis of how we ought to love one another. The Trinity also tells us that we can have unity in diversity. Okay, and I promise... This is actually something that I, a study that I started having, and I wrote this down long before any of the racial tensions started. I did not put this in here in response to politics. Um, God shows us how we can have unity in the middle of diversity. This is really, really important because God is three distinct persons. He's not a unity of like with like. He's a unity of like with unlike. They're three, di- three different persons. And he actually reflected that in how he created mankind. Um, He created man male and female. And anyone who has been married knows how different those two things are. I had some reminders of that this morning, actually, as I was getting ready to come here. We are very different genders. But God expects these two distinct sexes to be united and to function as one. And when they do, part of what makes that so glorious is that that's reflecting the nature of God himself. In, In the same way, this church here is full of very different people right? People in this church have different interests, different gifts, different convictions on various issues, different we- even different weaknesses. Some people here are kind of like me. You love learning about theology. You love learning about the reasons and evidence to be a Christian. That's right up my alley. I love it. Some people here really like to focus on the comfort that God can bring to people who are hurting and on the peace that he can give you to make it through the day. Here's the thing. Neither one of us are wrong. Those are both important aspects of who God is. And the fact that we have those differences and can come together and worship in unity is how we better reflect the nature of God himself. Um, Some people here like to emphasize the importance of understanding God's holiness, right? 
God is perfectly holy, and we need to strive to be holy and be good, be good people and strive to grow into the image of Christ. It is important. That's not how we gain God's acceptance, but that is an important part of the Christian walk. Some people here really like to focus on understanding God's grace and the fact that our failures have no impact on our standing before God because we've been covered by the grace of Christ. Both of those truths are important. And the fact that we can have both of those people with different emphases and focuses and come together and worship, to worship God together is part of how we reflect the image of God. So, why does the Trinity matter? Ultimately, the Trinity matters to Christians because God matters. God is the source of everything in our lives. And there is nothing more important for the believer than to come to know and understand God. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us that we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, John 17.3 says, This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, when they use the word know there, they're not just talking about intellectually, and they're not just talking about relationally. It's both. Um, there's, a, there's a passage uh, by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He's a famous preacher from about 200 years ago um, that he spoke about knowing God. I think it's very well said, so I'll quote him here. It's very, just a paragraph. Spurgeon said that, uh, It has been said that the proper study of mankind is man. Well, I believe it is equally true that the proper study of God's people is God. The proper study of a Christian is the Godhead. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy that can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls Father. He wrote that when he was, I think, 18, by the way. I'm going to finish with this quote by Jer uh, from the book of Jeremiah that I think really expresses this well. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. Jeremiah 9.28 um, As we leave here, I want us to really focus on thinking about the fact of who God is and about the, primarily focus on the, the love of God in our relationships. We're going to go home, and we're going to have lots of opportunities to express love or to fail to express love to those around us. How are we going to do it, and why are we going to do it? Why are we going to show love to those around us? Are we going to do it to get things from them, whether that be affection or affirmation, or are we going to do it simply out of willing and loving the, and desiring what's good for that person? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time we can get together and talk about who you are and learn about uh, your nature and why that matters for us. Lord, I pray that as we leave here, we will remember that the people um, in the streets, the people outside, don't have the incredible hope that you give us. I pray that you'll give us compassion for them and a desire to share that hope with them. And I thank you so much for the incredible love you have for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.